Uh, Psalm 22 is where we will be. Um, I know on the screen it says uh, Psalm 22, 1 through 11. Um, but, uh, but man, just after, after spending time this morning uh, finishing prep, I was like, man, we're... We're leaving out some meat, uh, so we're, we're, we're going to continue on uh, through verse 18 in Psalm 22, so if you're writing down your notes, it's Psalm 22, 1 through, uh, well really even 1 through 19 uh, is where we'll be this morning, and this is, um, man, this is just such a beautiful psalm. I know, I know for a lot of us, we, we spend a good bit of time uh, in psalms uh, to see Man, to see God being praised and to see God being exalted throughout the Psalms is, is remarkable. But as we look here, um, what we're going to see this morning is more of a psalm of, of groaning, um, a psalm of coming from hurt and pain, but a psalm that is still nonetheless remarkably beautiful. Um, and, and I think for so many of us, when, when we go through uh, times of hardship and affliction and, and heartache, we'll, we'll skip over to the next psalm. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But what we see here in Psalm 22, it is, y'all, it, it is such a beautiful picture of just what suffering ha- has brought us as the church. And, and one thing I do want us to see is as we read this psalm, this is, this is penned by the hand of, of King David. But, but as we read, shove David to the side because this, this is not uh, about David, honestly, at all. And, and, and as we'll read here in a second, and even verse one, it, it'll become remarkably clear that this is, um, this is a prophetic psalm. This is... Um, God using the pen of David to point us to Christ and to point us to Christ on the cross and, and as we see his heart and, and, and as we see him hurting but him trusting and resting in and hoping in the Father himself. This morning I, I want us to see two, two things. I want us to see the, the beauty of the cross but, but also for us as, as believers to see what it is to suffer and what it is to suffer well from the eyes and from the life of, of Jesus himself. Um, you know, some, some commentators will call this psalm the, the gospel according to David. And, um, and as we're about to see here in a second, it is, um, I think that's a really beautiful description of, of what we're about to read this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Psalm 22, uh, we're going to begin reading verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and they were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb, and you made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Um, as, uh, as I was studying uh, through, through this psalm this week and, um, and, and just getting ready to, to spend time with y'all this morning, I, I, I cannot help but think of, 
of so many of you that, that I do know who in, in recent days and weeks and, and months have, you've gone through hard times. You, you've, lost, you've lost family members. Um, you've gone through financial hardship, uh, stress at your work, stress in relationships, frustration, anguish, heartbreak. The, the list could go on and on for, for all of us in this room. Suffering is just a, a very real part of who we are. If you've walked the face of this earth, you have suffered. And it is, it is no different. It is no different for Christ himself. And, and this morning, what I want us to see, for, first point uh, in, in the sermon this morning is for us to see that suffering is a very real reality for every single one of us who have graced the face of this earth. If you are not in a hard time right now, you are going to be. And Jesus himself was no different. As, as he graced the face of this earth, he suffered and he bled and he died. And even, even in verse one, we, we see a verse that I think for, for so many of us immediately uh, it, it clicks in our brain as being incredibly familiar as, as Jesus himself sits on the cross and he goes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it, it is by no accident that Jesus utters those words to point us back here to Psalm, Psalm 22 and, and in a psalm where, where the, the, the character, the, the, the person who, who's talking here in Psalm 22 is described as the, the suffering servant and Jesus himself it's very much so that. As he goes to the cross and, he, and he's, as he's mocked and scorned and beaten and crucified, Jesus himself, he died in our place. He died the death that we should have. The one who knew no sin died for sin. The one who, who knew no sin, he knows suffering because of sin. And, and, and church, I, I think one of the most important realities we have to see this morning is Jesus knows what you're going through. For any of you in here, Jesus knows what, you've going, what you're going through and, and, and he's gone through worse. As Jesus, as Jesus goes to the cross and as the, the wrath and the full force of the fury of God is poured out on him for all of sin, for all of time, he, he knows suffering better than any of us in this room will ever know. But that is not to say that, that verse two doesn't sound so incredibly familiar for any of us in here. That, that we're, we're, we're crying out to God that we spend day after day, prayer time after prayer time, going, God, make, make this pain go away. God, will, will, you, will you please heal me? God, will you please heal my family member? God, will you, will you somehow step in and, and make my financial situation better? God, will you take away this heartache? God, will you take away this fear? And we cry out day by day and, and, and we try to go to sleep at night and there is zero rest for us. You can't go to sleep because of all the fear and all the worry and the thoughts racing through your mind. You snap awake at three, four, five o'clock in the morning. You can't go to bed because you know it's waiting for you in the day that you're about to tackle. Every bit of what we see here in, here in verse one and verse two, it, it sounds so familiar because we feel hurt and we feel abandoned and our spiritual lives feel stone cold and we don't know where to turn and all we can do is cry and to be frustrated. But church, don't, don't think for a minute that just because things feel distant that God has forgotten you, that God is distant from you because he is not. And as a matter of fact, he, he knows the exact thing you're going through. If you, if you look on the bottom of the screen, um, the, those, those two verses in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. 
Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus understands whatever you're going through. Did you lose somebody you loved? Jesus had to deal with John the Baptist being beheaded and, and, and watching the, the, the baby that leapt for joy in his mother's womb to be executed because of the message he was proclaiming. Jesus, Jesus knows what it is to, to lose someone that you love. Have you going through heartache, a betrayal, or hurt? Jesus knows that. Judas sold him out. The disciples abandoned him at one point or another. As he's going to the cross, Jesus Jesus knows that feeling of isolation. Is it is it is it physical pain? And Jesus knows that too. As he's beaten, as his side is pierced as he hung on a cross to breathe his last breath. Jesus, Jesus knows pain. So don't think that whatever you're going through in, in your life, that not only does he know, but he's been there. And he is able to sympathize with us in all of our weaknesses, in all of our hurts, in all of our frustration. Jesus knows. And so for whatever we're having to embrace He is with us. And I love how even in in verses one and two, you see Jesus crying out and Jesus hurt and Jesus feeling isolated. But we see in Hebrews that, that Jesus in his life, he did not sin in anything. And church, what I want us to see is this, is there is a very godly way for each and every one of us as we go through suffering to grieve well, to mourn well, to be hurt, to seek God's solace, to seek God's strength. There there is a very godly way to do that. There there is a way by, by which we can just lay our heart before God and to not question him or to not shake our fist at him, but to go, God, I'm hurt. God, I'm scared. God, I feel alone. God, I feel abandoned. And in and, and, and all of that, how did Jesus not sin? Look, look in verse three, because Jesus, in, in all of this, he doesn't sin, he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't walk away from God, because the second point this morning is we keep our eyes focused on the character of God in the midst of all of our suffering. You see Jesus pouring his heart out in verse two, and then verse three, how does it start? Yet you are Holy. God, you are holy. Who am I to question you? As Jesus prays in the garden, God, not my will, but your will be done. And and, and in all of, of our sufferings and our frustrations, if we allow our circumstance to tinge how we see God, our faith is gonna be a train wreck. If we let how we feel and how cold things feel or how scared or how hurt, if we allow all those things to influence how we approach God, our faith is gonna be an absolute train wreck. But Jesus himself sets the example, I'm gonna focus on the character and on the person and on the track record of who God is. And even in verses three through five, you, you see, you see the, this psalm just laying out who God is. And the, and the first thing is this, is in this we see that God is holy. He is set apart. He is sanctified. He is awesome. He is remarkable. God is so far above each and every one of us that he is gonna work and move and step in and do things that we don't understand, that we don't see the end game in but we still have to trust because he works in ways that we simply do not understand. Do, do we understand the first Peter chapter one that, that, that in our hurt and in our trials that he's refining our faith and making it more precious? 
Do we understand that whatever we're having to go through the James chapter one, that in us he is producing endurance and perseverance? Or do we, or do we see in Corinthians that, that in our afflictions, God is storing up for us an eternal weight of glory? Because in all of those things, we can't see that in the midst of our hurt. But we trust that he is holy, that he is just, he knows what he's doing, and we might not. And so for us, we, we simply have to trust in a holy God, even when it hurts. And I love what Psalm twenty two twenty three 23 says, that you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. Y'all, that's just a matter of verses. After the psalm says, they are piercing my feet. And I can count my bones and my heart is melted like wax. Yet I will praise you. Church, may, may that be our heart. And that, that only happens when we stay fixed on who he is. When we stay fixed on the fact that he is holy. And who am I as a human to question a holy and righteous and just God? The second thing is this, is that, that, that in this, even in this text, we see that God is sovereign. He's ruling and reigning over all things. Even when we can't see his fingerprints, over the situation, even when we can't see the why of what's going on, that he is in control. And that he is working, he is molding, he is shaping. Because for David, when, when he has to go through, go through the punishment that, that God poured out on him for his sin with Bathsheba, do you think David saw the end game? Do you think David saw the hope in the midst of the darkness? Possibly not, but he still trusted. Do you think Job saw God restoring all things after all, everything that he owned, every person that he loved was ripped away from him? Do you think Paul saw the why of being shipwrecked and stoned and mocked and beaten and scorned and thrown in prison do you think he saw the why in the midst of all of that? But it is that why that makes Philippians so much more weighty that Paul himself could be joyful in all the things that he had to face. We might not understand the why, but God does. And he is working in the midst of your heart. So don't think he's abandoned you or left you or that he's abdicated his throne because he is still on the throne. He is still ruling and reigning. And he has not forgotten you. And third thing is this, is he is faithful. In these verses, you see words like the people of Israel are delivered, that they're rescued, that they're not put to shame. God does not abandon his kids. And God has not left you. Wherever you're, wherever you're at in your suffering right now, he has not left you and he has not abandoned you. I love what Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse nine says. It says, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God does what he says he's gonna do. And he is still faithful even when our pain tells us otherwise. He has not forsaken you. He has not abandoned you. He is with you. He has a plan even for your pain. And that's what we look to. That's what we look to when, when all of the circumstances, when all of the people here in Psalm 22 that are mocking him, when all of your doubters and all of your critics and all of the people who do not like you, when they want to wag their hand in your face, you can still say, when everybody else is not, God is faithful. He is good. He is just. And so church, when it hurts, look at him and his love 
and his character, his sovereignty, his faithfulness, his strength, his righteousness. That's what we focus on when we have nowhere else to turn to. And that's what Jesus himself even does here. Is even though he's frustrated, even though he's crying out, even though God is not letting this cup pass from him, Jesus' answer is, God, you know what? Even though this hurts, even though this is scary, you are holy. And may that be our heart. Even when it hurts, even when we're scared, God, you are holy. Because ultimately, suffering does produce, as, as Paul says, a weight of glory, but suffering in, in this case and in this psalm produces for us as believers a remarkable bounty in what Jesus does on the cross. And so the third thing this morning is I want you to see that the suffering of Christ has brought us grace. It has brought us life. It has brought us hope. It has brought us everything. And, and as you look at the things that, that Jesus has to suffer here in this psalm in verse 6, that he's, that he's humiliated. In verse 7, he's mocked. In verses 12 through 16, you see, you see just the absolute physical torment that Jesus is in. In verses 17 and 18, you see Jesus being stripped down naked to be completely isolated and humiliated to just have just a, a, a handful of people at the cross that are there to support him and that are there because they love him. Jesus, for all intents and purposes, is completely isolated as he hangs on that cross. But what that suffering won for us as the church and as his bride is, is an absolutely remarkable and beautiful thing. And one of the things that I want us to see is just as much as we sit in our hurt and we want to shake our fist at God and God go, God, why are you doing this to me? We need to ask ourselves, God, why did you do this to him? Why did this happen to him? Why did, why did a perfectly sinless man, the only son of God, why did he have to suffer in my place? Why did he have to die? In church, I just want us to take a couple of minutes and, and to just fly through scripture and to see what the affliction and the hurt and the suffering of Christ ha has won us because it is, it is glorious and it is beautiful and, and apart from the fact that suffering exists, none of this is a reality for us. None of this is a reality for the church. So the first thing I want us to see this morning is what the, cry, the, the cross of Christ has won us it is first is it is our redemption. Galatians chapter three, verse 13, it says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Christ bought us back by going to the cross and suffering, and bleeding, and dying. He bought us back from the dominion of sin. He brought us back from the dominion of death, like we're going to see here, here in just a, a couple of moments. He has redeemed us. He has done a transaction and a purchase that none of us could do ourselves. The cross of Christ has won us our redemption. The second thing is this, is, is the cross of Christ has won us our forgiveness. Isaiah 53, 5, such a beautiful, uh, beautiful chapter in Scripture. And it says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. It is because of him having his hands and feet pierced that we see there in Psalm 22 that we can say we are forgiven because as we see all through scriptures, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And because of the shed blood of Christ, for all people, for all time, for those who trust in him, we are forgiven. That blood of Christ that was excruciatingly ripped out of his body 
is the blood that allows us to be considered a forgiven son and daughter of God. Third thing is this, is the cross of Christ won us our righteousness. Romans 5, 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. There isn't a single one of us in this room that can ever be counted as righteous apart from the work of Christ. We've all sinned, we will all continue to sin, and it is only by Christ. And only by as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that being credited with that righteousness that you and I can be counted as such. The suffering death of Christ has won us our righteousness. Fourth thing is this, it is the cross has won us victory over death. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all of those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Death has a very real fear in our life. And it always cracks me up that the number one fear is talking in front of people, but number two is death. Um, I don't understand that. But when we think of what, literally just leaving this life, of being sat down in a box, and buried in the ground. And for us, one of our greatest fears is just being forgotten. That the life that we have lived, that it won't matter anymore, that the stuff we've built up, the things that we have done, that it will pass away. But for the believer, the sting of death is gone in the fact that when we die, man, we are enveloped in the glory of the Father. That faith becomes sight, that as Philippians 1 says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We only get to say that because of what Jesus has done. Because our legacy doesn't matter. The only thing that matters on this earth is God's kingdom, not ours. And as we die and as we leave all of our stuff and all of our family and all of our friends behind, the thing that we are embracing is the one that we have lived our life for. That is the only way, that is the only reason that we have victory in this life and it's because Jesus has won us that. Fifth thing is this, is, is the cross of Christ has won us victory over Satan. Colossians chapter two, verses 14 and 15. Jesus, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. As much as, as the enemy himself wanted to rob God of all of his glory in the garden in the very beginning, and from that moment until then, Satan has done everything in his power to try to rob God of his glory. But as Jesus goes to the cross, he took every bit of that glory robbing that the enemy had, and he nailed it to the cross and he shoved it to the side. Because for, for Jesus, the enemy has no victory. Jesus has won that final victory. He made that statement on the cross and he will continue to make that statement as he comes back again for his bride. The cross is the reminder that Jesus has already won. We don't wait for that trumpet call and for, for Christ to come back on the clouds for us to say we've won. No, we already have because he has done it. He has won it. Live every single day even the dark days of hurt and of heartache in view of that victory and in view of what Jesus has already won. Because ultimately it's, it's, it's this, the, the cross of Christ has won us fellowship with the Father. First Peter chapter three, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. How can an unholy people approach a, a remarkably holy God? It is by Christ. It is by Christ alone. As Bobby sat on this stage a few weeks ago and reminded us of. We have fellowship with the Father because of what Jesus has won us. 
We have restoration and hope and relationship because of him. And if you look at this whole list, church, I pray you would, you would focus on the last one more than any of them. Because our ultimate victory is the fact that we have relationship with the creator of the world, with the one who has formed us and shaped us and loved us before time began, that he reconciled all things that we can have fellowship with him and that we can sit there, as Hebrews chapter 8 says, and just to look at the creator of the world and go, you are my dad. You are my heavenly father. I love you. I want to spend my life in, in, in pursuit of you. Because ultimately for, for us as the church, that should be enough. He should be enough. And that's the last thing I want us to see this morning is in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the heartache, may his nearness be enough. May his nearness be all that we need. If you, if you still have your Bibles open, um, look back in verse 11. It says this, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, there is none to help. And then to flip over to verse, um, to flip over to verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, o, o you, my help, come quickly to my aid. For Jesus, even though these, these dogs are encircling him and, and his hands and feet are being pierced and he's suffering and dying, in verse 11, his heart is, God, just be near me. God, be with me. Be by my side. And church, that, that, is, the, that is the only way that we suffer well. That is the only way that for you and I that we can say we are content in Christ because it, our contentment does not come from what we're experiencing, but it comes from him and from him alone. Church, is, is, is that true of us? Do, do we mirror the heart of Paul when, when he pleads for his thorn in the flesh to be removed? And God says No. And he reminds Paul that my grace is sufficient in your weakness. And Paul goes on to say, well, then may I all the more boldly boast about my weakness. As you pray for that cancer diagnosis to go away, or as you pray for your financial situation to get better, or as you pray for the dark clouds in your life to be lifted and for the sun to seemingly shine for the first time that you can ever remember are you content in him and in him alone? Because if, if, if we are not careful, we fall in love with God's power and not his presence. We, we, want, the, we want his movement and not his nearness. Church, for, for us, we, we should all the more gladly say that that you are enough. When we talk about the sufficiency of Christ, it is that Jesus is enough even when the rest of my life is tearing apart at the seams. And that's not, that's not an easy thing to say. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing to say, God, you're, you're enough. God, you are good. God, you are just when our lives are in shambles. You know, for, for, for me in, in just being born without arms, like I, I've... I, I've come to, to, to get used to taste affliction and frustration. And it, but it took me 15 years of my life to finally say God is good. God is enough. And, and, and I got to that place where I, was, where I was satisfied, where I could say God was enough, even though my armless body definitely wasn't. And I'd gotten used to that. And, and, and a few years ago, as... Um, you know, uh, Heather, was, Heather was pregnant with our, with our youngest little girl, Elliot, and, um, and, and she, was, she was diagnosed with a benign tumor. And it was a benign tumor that had to be removed, a benign tumor that was attached to the uterus, and it, and it, was, it was a surgery that not only posed a risk to Heather, but it posed a risk to Elliot. And as we sit there in the, the, those pre-op pre -op meetings, the doctor's telling us, well, well listen, it's, it is a small chance but you, you, you possibly could lose both your wife and your daughter in the surgery. 
And, and I'm used to like dealing with my stuff and dealing with my hurt. But, but, but God, you, 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 can't, you can't take the people I love. This, this, this is something I'm not, I'm not used to, God. I'm not, I'm not accustomed to this. And, and I just remember the fear that kept playing over and over in my mind. And I will never forget as we, as, as we drive to, to Duke that morning for the surgery. And it is incredibly early. And of course, of, of all things, it's like a, a blizzard hits the Research Triangle Park. And that day, we're supposed to get 8 to 10 inches of snow. And even as we drove, the, the flurry started and, and the snow started building up. And so all of the people that were going to come sit with me in the waiting room were like, nah, dude, I'm, you know, I don't want to die because of all those other North Carolina drivers. So I'm going to sit this one out. And so I kiss my wife goodbye. And she, she goes back into surgery and, and I sit there by myself in the waiting room, not, not knowing what's going to happen next. And, and, I, and I'm scared, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just looking out at that snowfall and just feeling, I feel a lot like that snow, you know? I, I, feel, I feel cold, and, and I, just my, my, my soul was just silent. And, and I was just, I was scared, and so I'm like, I'm just, I'm just going to bury my nose in a book because at that point I'd prayed my face off. I had, I had studied in scripture. I was, I was just... I didn't know where else to turn, so I was just like, I'm going I'm to take my mind off of this. And I opened up a book, and, and, it, and it's a book called Look and Live by this guy named Matt Papa. And, and I, I couldn't have read for, for 15 minutes, and I, and I came upon this quote. And, um, man, you want to talk about God snapping your heart. The, um, the, 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 the quote is this, my scars are numerous, my flesh is powerless, my enemy is dangerous, but my God is glorious, and his grace is completely sufficient. Church, may, may we get to a place where we can say that, and, and, and even in that moment, like, I became convicted as I sat in that waiting room, and as, as honestly, I started to cry, and and I'm sitting there by myself and all these other people in the waiting room are watching me cry and everybody's like worried like, did he, did he get bad news? Like, and so like people are coming over and like hugging me and I'm like, it's fine, it's happy tears, happy tears. Uh, I'm good. Uh, and, uh, and, and even up into that point, I, I don't think I, I had said in my own heart that God, you, you are glorious. God, your grace is, is sufficient. And it, it is a hard thing to want God's nearness and not his movement, not his action. It is incredibly difficult to go, God, even if my pain never stops, you're good and you're glorious and you're just and, and I love you. It is a hard thing to say, but when we realize that, that y'all are suffering gives us a very distinct platform. Because in how many times in your life when you're hurt and you're getting the text messages, hey, are you okay? Hey, can I, how can I pray for you? When the people at work who might not even be believers are the people in your family, you're like, are, 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 are you good? How, how's things going? You have a, a watching world fixed on you. And what do we have the opportunity to say with our lives other than the fact that even when my life is not glorious, my God is? Church, may we, may we take advantage of that platform. May we suffer well. May we groan well. May we fix our eyes on him, on his character, on the cross of his son. And that in that, we can say in our hearts, God, I am fine to be with you and with nothing else.